بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول المؤلف رحمه الله تعالى باب من حقق التوحيد دخل الجنة بغير حساب The next chapter we're covering today inshallah ta'ala is the chapter in which the author said man حقق التوحيد chapter number three whoever establishes or fulfills tawheed دخل الجنة وانتد the paradise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala بغير حساب without any reckoning no accountability now it's an interesting chapter because entering the paradise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any account or any punishment is from the what of Tawheed from the virtues and the excellences of Tawheed and if you remember last week's chapter was what the excellence and the virtues of Tawheed so if last week's chapter was the excellence and the virtues of Tawheed why has the author made a separate chapter for something which is from the excellences of Tawheed because from the excellence of Tawheed you stand to Jannah without punishment but yet he's made a completely separate chapter for this one why the ulama they say لِجَلَالَتِهِ due to the status the honor and the reward of this particular virtue it deserves a separate chapter in itself so this chapter is bayan maqsood min al bab bayanu it's an explanation a clarification that whoever establishes a tawheed will enter jannah bi ghayri hisab no accountability no reckoning wala adab or any punishment whatsoever so what does it mean haqqaqa tawheed what does it mean to establish Tawheed or fulfill Tawheed? To establish Tawheed, they say, رُسُوخُهُ فِي الْقَلْبِ مَعَ السَّلَامَةِ مِمَّا يُنَافِيهِ That establishes the Tawheed is that Tawheed is firmly planted in the heart. Along with safety, security and abstaining from that which negates the Tawheed. So Tawheed, establishing it or fulfilling it, it should be firmly planted in your heart. Along with abstaining from the thing that negates that Tawheed. And the things that negate Tawheed, fil asl, are three things. Number one, a shirk associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, al-bid'ah, innovations in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number three, ma'asiyah, disobedience and sins. As for the first one, ashirku yunafihi bikulliyah. The first one, which is associate partners of Allah, it completely and utterly negates the Tawheed, completely. And what's the second one? Bid'ah, innovation in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This second one, Al bid'ah in a gates that which is obligatory from a tawheed. In a gates the obligation or the obligatory part of a tawheed. Yani to nafi kamaluhu al wajib. In a gates the perfection of tawheed. Bid'ah innovation in the religion in a gates the perfection of tawheed. And it's important for us to know what is bid'ah, what is an innovation. 
Because linguistically, this microphone is an innovation. Our mobile phones are innovation. What we mean by innovation is innovation in the religion, that somebody does something, hoping to get close to Allah with it, without any what? Proof or evidence. This is a bid'ah, fiddin. And number three, that negates tawheed in terms of decreasing its reward is what? Sins and disobedience. So therefore, if a person wants to fulfill tawheed, they have to abstain from three things. What's the first? A shirku. Secondly, bid'ah, innovation, religion. And lastly, sins. Is it possible to completely stay away from sins? It's not possible. So therefore, does it mean the one that sins really could never, ever, ever fulfill his tawheed? Because it's impossible to stay away from sins. So the ulama, they say, what is meant by tarqul ma'asiyah? What is meant by leaving of sins is al-mubadara ila tawbah. To hasten to repent. Al-mubadara ila tawbah. To hasten to repent to Allah. That is leaving of sins. How is this leaving of sins? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, At-ta'ibu min al-dhamb kaman la dhamb lah. The one that repents from sinning is as though he has no what? No sin at all. Because كُلُّ بْنَ آدَمْ خَطَّعُونَ All the sons of Adam, they're going to err, they're going to make mistakes, they're going to fall into sins. وَخَيْرُ خَطَّعِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ And the best of those who make mistakes and sins are those who repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. So therefore, the things that negate Tawheed, shirk, Bid'ah and not repenting from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Mu'allif rahimahullah ta'ala says, whoever establishes this tawheed, this oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dakhal al-jannah, will enter the paradise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the topic. Now, for this particular chapter, it brings three evidences. And each and every single evidence, we're going to go through them together, inshaAllah. We're going to look at it from two points. Number one, where is the proof in each evidence? Tahqiq tawheed, that tawheed has been fulfilled. In each evidence we bring. And number two, where is the evidence of the what? The reward, which is what? To enter the paradise of Allah bi ghayri hisab, without any measurement. And the reason it's important for us to look at the evidence of tahqiq tawheed in each ayah or hadith is to understand from these ayat. Because I don't want to rush the book, inshaAllah ta'ala. Even if a chapter takes us two, three sessions, it's okay. Because these ayat, azimah, they're great. And these are hadith, if we truly understand them and apply them to our lives. The first evidence the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, he brings is the saying of Allah. Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan qanitan lillah hanifan wa lam yakum minal mushrikeen. Allah Ta'ala says, Inna Ibrahim. The very Ibrahim. Who is Ibrahim? Min ulul azm. It's from the most steadfast, the most determined of the messengers of Allah. Wa ulul azm. The most steadfast of the messengers of Allah, they are five. For the young men here, they should know ulul azm. Who are the foremost or steadfast of the messengers of Allah. Can any of the young men here to tell me Ulul Azam min al Rusul? Naam. MashaAllah. We have a young man here. <laughs> Naam. Naam? Naam. Jazakallah khairan. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Naam. Isa Alayhi Salam. Ibrahim Alayhi Salam. And Musa Alayhi Salam. We reach four. We reach four. There are five. We don't Isa. Nuh alayhi salam, jazakallah khairan. So these are ulul azm. Ulul azm. So Ibrahim min ulul azm. And not only from ulul azm, what's also special about Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam? Barakallah fi khalilu rahman. The only two are the messengers of Allah that are khalilu. And al khullah is the highest form of what? Highest form of love. Because there's hub or mahabbah and there's khullah. The highest form of love is what? Al-khullah. And Allah Ta'ala only took two khalil. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. 
And this khulla, Allah Ta'ala use it in the Quran, this highest form of love, when Allah Ta'ala says, Al-akhillā'u yawma idhin ba'duhum li ba'din adu illa al-muttaqeen. That the people that have the highest love for each other in this dunya, there will be enemies one to the other yawm qiyamah on the day of judgment illa al-muttaqoon, except for those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibrahim Khalil Rahman, he said, this Ibrahim min ulu al-azm was Khalilullah. He said, inna Ibrahim kana ummah. Subhanallah. Ibrahim by himself was a ummah. Was a nation by himself. The ulama, they said, what is meant by ummah here is what? Imam was a leader. Mu'alliman lil khair wa qudwa. He was a leader. An example. A teacher of good. Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam was an imam, the example to be followed. So this ayah, Allah Ta'ala said, it was an ummah, somebody to be followed. And we find other ayahs in the Quran where Allah Ta'ala, he orders us to follow the millah of Ibrahim. Where Allah Ta'ala mentions is qudwatun hasana, is the best of examples. So Allah Ta'ala said, Ibrahim kana ummah. He was an example. He was an example. Qanitan, obedient, consistently obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the opposite of what? Disobedience, which is from the things that negate what? A tawheed in its perfection. Then Allah ta'ala says, Hanifan, it was Hanif. Hanif is from the verb Hanafa, which is to lean away from something towards something else. So somebody who is Hanif is leaning away from something towards something else. And in Sharia, it means ma'ilun an shirki ila tawheed. The one that leans away from shirk leans towards what? Tawheed. So somebody who is Hanif is leaning away from shirk and leaning towards what? A tawheed. So Allah Ta'ala said, kana hanifan. It was one that leaned away from shirk. Wa lam yakum min al mushrikeen. And it was not from the mushrikeen. Fil qawli. In his statements. Wal amal. Wal i'tiqad. And in his statements. In his actions. And his belief. So in this ayah. Allah Ta'ala said. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Was a leader. An example. Teacher to God. And obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Upon steadfastness. And he leaned away from shirk. And it was not from the mushrikeen. And each evidence. Before we look at the proof. Of the evidence concerning the chapter, look at the benefits from the ayah. Al Fawaid, number one, the At Tawheed, worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal in His oneness, is the Asl, the first Fa'idah, is the root of all religions. Every single religion, the root of it is monotheism. Number two, Wujubul Iqtidabi Ibrahim, the obligation to follow the Millah of Ibrahim. In another ayah, Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَرْغَبْ عَنْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِهَا نَفْسَا Nobody stays away from the way of Ibrahim except for the one who is foolish. وَلَقَدِ اسْطَفَيْنَاهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا We have chosen him in the dunya. وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And in the hereafter, it's from the righteous one. Number three, it's obligatory and befitting that the one who calls to Allah is an example from, for others. Number four, Continuity in ibadah is from the attributes of the messengers of Allah. Number five, لا يسيح التوحيد A person's tawheed could never be correct except with what? Rejecting shirk. So you cannot say إلا الله You cannot say إلا الله only. It has to be what? Nothing deserves to be worshipped but Allah Azza wa Jal. Nothing. You have to negate and affirm. Number six, Refutation against the Quraysh who claim to be upon the Millah of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Now for us to go through this. The chapter is what? Whoever fulfills a tawheed will enter Jannah. The evidence we looked at, the ayah. In this ayah, where is the fulfillment of tawheed? By Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. How did he fulfill the tawheed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wasafahu bi awsaf. Allah described him with attributes, 
Mubayyina, that makes it clear, أَنَّهُ حَقَّقَ التوحيد. He fulfilled the Tawheed. And what are the attributes Allah described him with in this ayah? Because we went through each one. What, what's the attributes Allah gave him? Huh? In the ayah. Jazakallah khairan, hanifan. He leaned away from shirk. Another attribute. وَلَمْ يَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ is not from the mushrikeen. So number one, قَدْ حَقَّقَ التَّوْحِيدِ He fulfilled the tawheed. Now, number two, he should enter Jannah without any measure, any, what? Any punishment. Where is the proof in this ayah? Allah Ta'ala said in the end of the ayah, وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ In the hereafter, it's from the salihin, the righteous one. One of the ulama of tafsir, as zujaj he said, As-salihu al-fa'iz. As-salihu fil akhirah al-fa'iz. The one who is righteous in the air after is the one who is successful. And what is the greatest success? To enter Jannah. Not just enter Jannah, bi ghayri hisab, without any, any reckoning or adab. So this is how this ayah, it corresponds to the chapter. The second evidence the Mu'allif rahimahullah ta'ala he brings is the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ خَشَّةِ رَبِّهِمْ مشفقون. This is in Surah Al-Mu'minun, all the way from 57 to 61. Allah Ta'ala says, those who stand in awe before their Lord. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ Those who believe in the revelation of their Lord. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ لَا يُشْرِكُونَ And those who do not associate partners with their Lord. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا أَتَوْ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَهُمْ لَهَا سَابِقُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who stand in awe before their Lord, and those who believe in the revelation of their Lord, and those who do not associate partners with their Lord, and those that from what they're given, they give it in charity. But yet they are fearful is not going to be accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ They know they return to their Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the believers with four descriptions. Number one, they stand in awe of their Lord. In awe, khashya of their Lord. Number two, they believe in the revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, they do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, لَا يَعْبُدُونَ غَيْرَهُ بِكُلِّيَّةِ They do not associate, they do not worship other than Allah Azza wa Jal at all. ظَاهِرًا وَبَاطِنًا Inwardly or outwardly. Openly or enclosure. And what does this mean? When we defined al-ibadah to worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we said Ibn Taymiyyah said, ismun jami' is a comprehensive term for everything Allah loves. From statements and actions. ظَاهِرًا وَبَاطِنًا Outward actions and inward actions. Therefore, ibadah, some of it is outward. So when Allah Ta'ala said they don't associate partners with their Lord, it means in the outward action. They do not call on anybody but Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. They do not seek deliverance from anybody but Allah Azza Wa Jal. And inwardly. What's an example of an inward act of worship? A tawakkul Putting your trust in Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. That even inwardly, they have no trust except in Allah. What's another inward action? al khashya They do not fear nobody but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's another inward action? al rajau They have no hope but in Allah azza wa jal. And this is the effect of Tawheed. That when we're speaking about Tawheed, worshipping Allah in His oneness, it's not only the outward action such as dua, such as salah, such as sujood. Even in your heart, your hope has to be in who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your tawakkul, which is to true rely on Allah azza wa jal, and took the, take the necessary steps, because Allah has ordered you with that, that your trust only has to be in Allah azza wa jal. Your khashya, your fear, in that which no one has ability to do anything, except for Allah, should only be in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said they don't associate partners with Lord, their Lord. And the last attribute, they give, they do righteous deeds, but yet their fear, it will not be accepted from them. 
Allah Ta'ala said, Ula'ika yusari'una fil khayrat. These are the ones that hasten to do good. Wahum laha sabiqoon. And they are the leaders in this. The fawa'id from the ayah is wujub al khawf min adhabillah. The obligation of fearing the punisher of Allah. Number two, the obligation of believing the revelations of Allah. Tahrimu shirk the impermissibility, prohibition of shirk in all its types and forms. Being concerned whether your deeds are accepted is from the attributes of the righteous ones. And number five, racing to do good deeds. Now how does this ayah corresponds with the chapter? These people haqqaqu tawheed, they fulfilled tawheed. And where is the proof of their fulfillment of tawheed in this ayah? They don't associate partners with their Lord. And where is the proof of the reward which is Jannah in this ayah? Allah Ta'ala says, Ula'ika, these are the ones Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala yusari'una fil khayrat. They're raising goodness. Wahum laha sabiqoon. And they're the foremost, the leaders. Wasabuku. And being the leader in the hereafter means what? Al Jannah. Paradise without any measurements or without any reckoning, I'm sorry, or any punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last evidence the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, he brings is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In this hadith, sahabi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Da and Hussein ibn Abdul Rahman, kuntu inda Sa'id ibn Jubair, faqal, أيكم رأى الكوكب الذي انقض البارحة Which one of you saw the star or the shooting star that fell yesterday? فقلت أنا ثم قلت أما إني لم أكن في صلاة ولكن لذغت قال فما صنعت قلت ارتقيت This sahabi رضي الله تعالى عنه It was asked which one of you saw the star yesterday. And he said, that as for me, I, the shooting star by the way, he said, I didn't. He said, I did, then I said, I would have been at the prayer, he saw the shooting star, I would have been at Isha, but I was stung, meaning it was stung by a scorpion. So they asked him, well, so what did you do? He said, I treated it with ruqya. Ruqya is to read Quran or dua upon something. He asked, and they asked him, what made you do Ruqya? He said, a hadith of a Sha'bi related to us. He said, what hadith? He said, he reported from, to us, from Burayda ibn al-Husayb, that he, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ruqya is not for the evil, is not but for the evil eye or for poisonous thing. So Ruqya, he said, is for the Ayn, Al Ayn. The other day I saw the video of a speaker speaking about Al Ayn. Al Ayn, it means an evil eye. And there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the death for a lot of people from our Ummah Bil Ayni by the evil eye. And in this lecture, the person was making a mockery of the, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, if this is really, really, really true, somebody we don't want to be president or a leader, many people hate him. So all we have to do is just stare at him and give him the laser glaze. And khalas, he would just die or be sick. So therefore, the ayn could not affect somebody. He was making mockery of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa There's no such thing as ayn. That just by looking at somebody or giving them a stare down, that all the people will hate now, we should just give them a stare eye. We just stare them down, give them a laser glaze, and they'll not be affected. They should be affected if this hadith is true. Based on his what? On his intellect, or so-called intellect. The Prophet ﷺ said, al aynu haqqun, the evil eye is true. And that's why he treated Uruqya. But although it's true, just like sihr, just like magic, Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِينَ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ They could not harm anybody except with what? the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this sahabi, he said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ruqya, reading the Quran or dua for an ailment 
or for an affliction is for the eye and the poisonous thing. Then the person said, he does well who acts upon what he heard. But even Abbas reported to us from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he said, the nations were displayed before me. I saw a prophet and with him there was a small group of people. So some prophets, Yom Qiyamah, they'll come with a small group of people. And a prophet with whom there was only one or two persons. So there's some anbiya that will come Yom Qiyamah and they only have one or two people with them. And he said, and a prophet, ahad. he had nobody with him. Nobody. So success in da'wah. For a prophet to come Yom Qiyamah, two questions, with nobody with him, or you, any one of us, to come Yom Qiyamah according to Allah, we don't have a single follower. Have we been successful or have we failed? For a prophet or any one of us to come Yom Qiyamah without a single follower, number one, have we been successful or have we failed? The answer to that is this. If you call to Allah Ta'ala and call to what Allah Azza wa Jalla ordered you and the way Allah Ta'ala ordered you, because calling to Allah has to be fillahi, for the sake of Allah. Lillahi. Oh, for the sake of Lillahi, upon the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Okay? Wa billahi, seeking the assistance of Allah. If you call to Allah and you don't have a single follower, you've been successful. If you did it in the right way. Success, just like this class today, is not measured by the amount of people you, you have in your class. The amount of followers you have. It is measured by what? The way you did it. And that's why they say, Ittiba'u sunnah, to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, khayrun wa afdal min kathratil amal, is better for you than many actions or much actions. For example, Salatul Fajr. There's a sunnah before Salatul Fajr. If I do the sunnah Salatul Fajr and I was to read a long surah, for example, half of Baqarah in each rak'ah, or I read a short surah for the sunnah of Fajr, such as Kafirun and Ikhlas, which one is more rewardable? Now, a long surah or the short surah? Short surah. Why is the short surah more rewardable? Huh? It's the sunnah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the sunnah before salatu fajr is very short. So the one who does the short one, he gets more reward than the one that does the long one. Likewise, success is ittiba, following the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa even if you had nobody with you. So some anbiya will come yawm qiyamah and he has nobody with him. This Nabi that comes Yom Qiyamah with nobody, the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith goes on, he sees a great crowd. And this is the Ummah of who? Musa Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And he thinks, SubhanAllah, this is my Ummah. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told, Tazawwaju, marry al-walud al-walud. My women were loving, we bear more children. So I could be the most Yom Qiyamah. So we think this is his Ummah. But we see a greater crowd. And this is the crowd of who? Or the Ummah of who? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So every single prophet will come with their ummah. This prophet, وَلَيْسَ مَعَهُ أَحَدَ had nobody with him. Is he an ummah? Is he an ummah? He has nobody with him. Is he an ummah? Naam. This brother's paying attention. And where is the proof that he's an ummah? We just done it in the class. Inna Ibrahim. Ibrahim was an ummah. And Ibrahim was the only person at one time amongst his people worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. But yet it was an ummah. That for Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, he was the only one. Which is why they, when they built that fire, they built it for him. They gathered everything. Forget the bonfires. They gathered everything they could to build that fire. So large was the fire for Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. They didn't put him into the fire. How did they put him in the fire? They catapulted him into the fire. They catapulted him. It was too large for them to even go near the fire. But ummah, and that's why the ulama of tafsir, they say the reason Allah Ta'ala called Ibrahim an ummah, we know it means imam, 
That, no matter how many you are, even if you're one person, لا تستوحش مع قلة السالكين Never feel lonely, even if there's few people that tread that path with you. You by yourself, you are an ummah. You are a nation. Because a person that understands Tawheed, يغلب ألف من علماء المشركين would defeat a thousand of the ulama or the polytheist. So some prophets will come, يوم القيامة ليس معه أحد. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, as for my ummah, there was another great mass. It was said to me, this is your ummah. وَسَبْعُونَ ألف and 70,000 of these people from your ummah يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةِ They'll enter the paradise without reckoning or punishment. Then when he stood to enter his house, the big people began to wonder, who, that, who might these people be? They'll enter Jannah, 70,000, without any reckoning or punishment. Some said, maybe they're the companions of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some said, maybe those born in Islam would never associate with anything with Allah. And still others were suggested. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appeared before them to tell them. He said, they're the ones that do not seek ruqya, not follow omens, nor get themselves characterized. And upon their Lord, they do trust. Then Ukasha, Ibn Mihsan, student said, Oh Allah, ud'u Allah an yaj'alani minhum. Ask Allah to make me amongst them. He said, you are one of them. Then another man stood, saying to, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ask Allah to make me amongst, among them. He said, Ukasha sabaqaka Ukasha. Ukasha has preceded you. So in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, that there are people from this ummah, they'll enter Jannah bi ghayri hisab, without any reckoning, wala adab, or any punishment whatsoever. Then he gave or he mentioned the attributes of these people. From the attributes of these people is they do not seek ruqya. They do not follow omens. They do not associate partners with their Lord. Wa ala rabbihim yatawakkalun. And they put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For what it is this hadith, the benefit of this hadith is number one, the permissibility of a ruqya for evil eye and stinging or poisonous sting. The permissibility, the deepness of the knowledge of the salaf. Amal bil kitab wa sunnah. The acting according to the Quran and sunnah comes before every school of thought. In it, is the excellence of the Salaf and their good way of relating information. Number, next benefit, لَيْسَتِ الْحُجَّ مَحْصُورَ فِي الْأَكْثَرِيَّةِ Evidence or proof is not based on the majority. The excellence of Musa and his people, the excellence of the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the eagerness of the Sahaba in doing that which is good, the permissibility of discussion as debate as the Sahaba did in order to reach the truth. Also, whoever has these four attributes that I mentioned in the hadith, haqqaqat tawheed, has fulfilled tawheed, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his oneness. Also, jawaz talab dua min ahli al-fadl, the permissibility of asking dua for people that you hope their dua will be answered. People of excellence, the ulama, the righteous. طيب. So in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions that they do not seek a ruqya. Is it permissible to do ruqya? Naam. So what's this hadith? What's the difference between seeking ruqya and doing ruqya? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did Ruqya. But the difference here is seeking Ruqya. But is it impermissible to seek Ruqya? Is it impermissible? But it, it is better not to seek Ruqya. And this is an important topic, especially in the time we're in nowadays. There are many people, when they're afflicted, it could be the evil eye, it could be sihr, it could be just mess because there's different ways that the jinn affects a person. And it's an important topic here. And part of your tawheed, 
is to know wa ma hum bidharin min ahad illa bi idnillah the jinn cannot affect you or harm you except by the permission of Allah azza wa jalla but issue of seeking ruqya it is better you do ruqya for you for your own self because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he taught the sahaba ruqya and if you're doing ruqya for yourself reading quran upon yourself who's afflicted you and Allah Ta'ala says, أَمَّا يُجِيبُ مُطَّرَّ إِذَا دَعَى Who answers the dua of the one that's afflicted? Because you're feeling the pain in your heart when you ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala will answer you. And by doing ruqya for yourself, it increases your iman. You find people that have sihr or some kind of affliction, Allahu A'lam. Because when somebody has affliction, it's very difficult, unlike medicine, to diagnose. It's sihr. This is magic. This is ayn. Because when you go to some raqi, they'll say, this is sihr. Give you a definite diagnosis. This is an evil eye. This is an affliction by a jinn. How could you give a definite diagnosis for something min al ghaib? All they'll say to you is your auntie. Or remember that place, you ate that food. Anyone that gives you a definite diagnosis. No, this person, a person of bid'ah, and in some cases, is a mushrik himself. Anybody you go to for ruqya, he asks you your father's name, your mother's name, know this person is a mushrik because there's a reason to do this. Anybody, when you go for ruqya, ask you to give him something from your body part, your hair or anything, know he's a mushrik. Anybody you go to for ruqya, he gives you something to hang on your neck that he writes in a piece of paper, know this is a mushrik. So it's better you do ruqya for your own self. So some people are afflicted, every day they have to read Surah Al-Baqarah. What does this do to them? They end up memorizing Surah Al-Baqarah. The iman ends up increasing. So what is seen as an affliction, it becomes what? In it, a goodness. The, the iman increases. They're doing adhkar al sabah wal masa. They're not just relying once a week for this thing, quick fix. I go to somebody, reason on me, I'm going to be okay again. Because most people that are afflicted is because of the state of their iman. You find some people, they go for ruqya, they say, I'm afflicted, brother. And you ask them, do you pray salah to jama'ah, the fajr jama'ah in congregation? No. What about Dhuhr? No. Some of them will say the only salah they pray in Jama'ah sometimes is salah to Jumu'ah. This person doesn't need Ruqya, he needs Tawbah. He doesn't need Ruqya. Likewise, he opens up the gates to a lot of bad things. That now everybody, I'm afflicted, I've got Sihr, I've got Jinn. That one extreme leads to another extreme. So now you get people mocking the issue of Ruqya. That it's like everybody now needs Ruqya. Everybody needs ruqya. The other extreme that when you break your leg or you have a misfortune, I think is the ayn. Everything is the ayn here. Everything. For example, in winter, somebody catches a flu, like, mashallah, you're looking healthy today, brother. And it's winter. The next day, he turns out to work with flu. Akhi, I think that brother gave me ayn. It is winter. Seasonal flus are there. Another person, he goes parachuting. And you're like, mashallah, you look strong, brother. Mashallah ta'ala. You can hench today. And he's gone parachuting. And his parachute fails somewhere and he breaks his leg, which is normal if your parachute fails. The least you could do is break your leg. Ibn Akhi was Ain. Subhanallah. Everything is Ain, especially in this re Ain, 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 everything. No, if something abnormal happens, out of the norm, then you could say, is what is Ain? So once you don't seek Ruqya, but rather do the Ruqya yourself. If you're unable to, there's some people that can't read the Quran. There's some people that are so sick, like the one bitten by a scorpion, for example or the level of jinn or the possession has affected them to the point they've lost some of their mind. Then you could do ruqya upon them. But the al-aslu fi ruqya is for a person to do the ruqya for yourself. Tayyib. So in this, there's some important points which we end with. The fear of shirk, that we should all fear shirk. Number two, the arriya, doing deeds to show off, is a form of shirk. Number three, that sh that it is a kind of minor shirk, doing deeds to show off. That it is the most dangerous thing for the righteous. Afwan. Number one. Afwan. Number one is the various, knowing that's another chapter, knowing the people vary in their levels of tawheed. The meaning when we say haqqaqa tawheed, a person has fulfilled tawheed. That Allah, number three, has described Ibrahim as one of the, not being one of the mushrikeen. Number four is praise, Allah's praise, foremost, for the foremost amongst the awliya, from the escape of shirk. 
Number five, that one should avoid a ruqya is on the trace of tawheed. Number six, that tawakkul, dependence of Allah, includes these traits. Number seven, the depth of the companion's knowledge in that they knew that nobody will achieve this paradise without reckoning or punishment except with deeds, with doing good deeds. Number eight, the desire of the Sahaba for whatever is good. The virtue of this ummah in both its quantity and quality. The great number of Musa's companions that the nations were displayed before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all the way to number 22. I'd advise, inshallah ta'ala, for the brothers to get this book, Kitab Tawheed, the English version, so you can look at the, the benefits as well, inshallah ta'ala, and look at the important points which has been mentioned here by the Shaykh, rahimahullah ta'ala. And one point I wanted to stress on, to uh, emphasize on, is the great depth of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu knowledge. that they were eager to know. So out of this, there's a principle, the scholars, they mention. And that principle is this. Anything that the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never asked about, and they had the ability to ask about, and somebody asked about it today, it is a what? It's a bid'ah. Do you understand? Anything they didn't ask about, and yet they had the ability to ask about it, anybody to ask about it today is a bid'ah. And why is that? He mentioned the eagerness of the Sahaba. Is there anybody more eager in knowledge than the Sahaba? No. And as eager as we may be, is there any better person to answer the question than who? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so if there's a question they had an ability to ask about, yet they did not ask about it, and they had the best of people with them, the Prophet Sallallahu for you to ask about it today is what? It's a bid'ah in the deen. For example now, somebody asks about the ruling of hormone treatment, hormone treatment in the religion, the religious perspective. Is this a bid'ah? Did the Sahaba ask about this? Why didn't it, is it a bid'ah? No, why? Because it didn't exist in that time. But if somebody was to ask now, Isa alayhi salatu wa salam, rafa'ahu Allahu ilayhi, Allah raised him to him. How is this possible? Because when you reach a certain height in the heavens, there's no more oxygen. How is this possible? Is this a bid'ah? Naam, it's a bid'ah. And that's why Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala, when a person asks him, saying, yes, Allah is above his throne, is above his throne, we accept it. But how? Imam Malik said to him, what? That Allah being above his throne is what? Known. How is unknown? He said, anhu. For you to ask this question is a what? Is an innovation. I do not see you except for an innovator. So there's certain questions we get sometimes that, I'm not saying to ask things, but there's certain questions which is, question the Sahaba never asked. And the Prophet could have answered it, but yet people ask these questions. So inshallah ta'ala, we stop here. And in our next lesson, bi'idhnillah ta'ala, we'll move on to chapter number four, bi'idhnillah ta'ala, which is al-khawfu min ash-shirk, to fear ash-shirk. We stop here for any questions, inshallah. Naam. No questions? Naam. Wa alaykum salatullah. No. This ayah the brothers mentioned, he said, what about the ayah? فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ Whoever wishes to meet with Lord, فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا Should do a righteous action. وَلَا يُشْكُ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا She's not associate partners with his Lord. The ulama, they use this ayah for the proof of acceptance of deed. That any deed has to have two conditions. Number one is what? He has to do a righteous action. What is the definition of an action which is righteous? 
an action which is righteous, it has to be according to the what? The sunnah. In six affairs. This is very important. Especially now Ramadan coming up. In six affairs. Number one, fi sababihi. Why am I doing this action? For example, in Ramadan, we have the last ten nights of Ramadan. So if I choose in the last ten nights of Ramadan, on the 27th, hoping it's Laylatul Qadr, every year, not coincidentally, I go for Umrah on the 27th night. This is my reason. Is this a righteous action? Is it? It's not. Because when anything has a specialness or virtue, for you to do an act of ibadah duties, virtue must have a what? A proof. If I decide the 27th night, hoping Laylatul Qadr, I'm going to do Qiyam, I'm going to make Dua, is this okay? Yes. Because the Sunnah is to make Dua, to stand up in prayer. But the sunnah is not because it's the hot nights, I'm going to go for Umrah. So number one, the reason you're doing it, for it to be righteous, it has to be, re it has to be a good reason. Number two, fi az zaman in the time which you're doing it, to be a righteous action. I could not go for hajj except in which time? Dhul hijjah. I could not pray the salatu fajr before salatu fajr. Number three, the place in which you're doing it. Number four, al-qadr, in the way, in the measurement you're doing it. For example, I'm grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal today. So Salatul Isha, in my gratefulness, I make it eight raka'ah. It's not accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. Number five, in the kayfiyah, in how you are doing it. In how you are doing it. There has to be according to the word of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And number six, in its qadr, in its measurement, or in its wasf, in its description. That for Eid al-Adha, we're supposed to sacrifice bahimatul an'am. So I decide which is, it could be a goat, it could be a cow, it could be a sheep. But I'm more grateful this Eid al-Adha. I'm going to sacrifice a horse, which is permissible to eat. It's not allowed. Because this is what Allah Ta'ala prescribes. So number one, a righteous deed has to be according to the sunnah. Number two, وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّي أَحَدًا He has to be sincere. And this is many things people don't do. It's one or two things. Either lack of sincerity or many people are sincere but they don't do it according to the sunnah. And this is why part of tawheed is what? Negating bid'ah, innovation. That's an obligatory part of what? Perfection of Tawheed. So you find this class of Tawheed, inshallah ta'ala, we practice, we implement, it should make us closer to the Sunnah and avoid Bid'ah. Because in the same way, there's no way you could establish Tawheed except by rejecting Shirk. You could never establish the Sunnah except by rejecting what? Bid'ah. And Bid'ah is a very, very dangerous thing. Most of the Shirk we have in the Ummah today is from Bid'ah. And it takes away from the Sunnah. Now, any other questions? No. Why so to lot? The Bob is asking about the issue of Rukhya that there are some people that dip uh, a verse of the Quran written in uh, Zafaran, in Safran, and then they wash it off into water, into milk. What is the ruling of doing these things? Generally speaking, when it comes to ruqya, anything anybody does, whether some people, for example, they collect rainwater and they use that for ruqya to bar somebody, based on the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we sent down from the heavens, ma and tahura. So their logic, they use this. Some people take verse of the Quran, they wash it, they tell you to drink it. Any of these things is permissible so long as there's no what in it? Shirk. The issues I mentioned to you before, such as taking somebody's hair, such as asking what's your father's name, what's your mother's name. These, they contain what? A shirk. Why? When they ask you these questions, every single one of us has something to call with him, a qareen, somebody from the jinn. So this information, they pass it on to the jinn. So now that jinn will bring information. Because that Quran is with you all the time. He knows on the 5th of December 2012, he was in this house. And you'll be like, subhanAllah, he knows this. It's this place you had that drink, that's what he did sihr on you. 
So most people that ask these questions, they do it for that reason. Taking a part of your hair, everybody has a DNA for the jinn to recognize you because a sihr is an agreement between the magician and the head of the jinn. So they use a piece of your hair. Because most people to do sihr, they have to use a piece of something from you. And this is why I say those things are not permissible. Anything else, uh, za'faran, this deli, the salaf used to do it, to drink it, for example. Uh, Quran, red in water, to drink it, for example. Taking it and spraying it on the walls of the house, for example. The issue of perfume, you find when they're reading on somebody, they might put some musk below their nose. Because the jinn, especially the kafir jinn, they get difficulty when there's jinn, burning bukhur, black seed oil, or rubbing olive oil. And all of these have proof that olive oil, it permeates into the body completely. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that yajri shaytan fi ibn Adam majra dam. That the shaytan, it flows within the blood of Adam like his bloodstream. So when you put olive oil, it goes into the body completely and it burns them. In hospitals in Kuwait where they do ruqya, the first three months it's just olive oil. Or focusing on the head when it comes to a ruqya, especially the olive oil and the black seed oil. Because Allah Ta'ala says that it will seize mankind, nasiya. Where is the nasiya? The forelock. Because most process of thinking, it takes place from here. Thus why most people with jinn or other issues, they suffer from constant what? Migraine and headache. Because they usually sit here because of the faculties of the eyes and the seeing. Also the back. You find they have a lot of constant back problems, but of course with no explanation whatsoever. So these things, they have proof. The issue of, uh, subhanAllah, sidr, the sidr leaves, for example, it has proof. The issues of using things that makes a person vomit, because most people that have sihr is from something they've ingested. All of these, they have proof. And those with no proof, so long as there's no shirk, a person is completely open to do what he wants in that, inshaAllah.